My name is Stephanie Cristello. I'm the programming manager here at Expo. I'm also the editor-in-chief of The Scene, Chicago's International Journal of Contemporary and Modern Art. It is my pleasure to introduce you and welcome Dr. Daniel Berger, a collector, board of governor, and founder of Iceberg Projects to introduce today's Celebrating 150th, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Daniel. I'm trying to walk to a certain area where the light's not in my eyes. Um, well, thank you all for coming today. Um, I have the distinct pleasure and honor of really ser of serving on the Board of Governors for the School of the Art Institute. And, you know, through my gallery, Iceberg Projects, I also have the pleasure of working with a lot of students, a lot of alumni, a lot of faculty um, within our gallery. And our gallery space is located, if any of you don't know, it's in a carriage house, a turn of the century carriage house behind my home up on the north, north corner, northeast corner of the city. But really, we're here today uh, as the start of the 150th anniversary celebration for the School of the Art Institute. And as uh, some of you know, um, the school was started in 1866 by a collective of artists which then grew into what is now an amazing world-class school in a very unique situation being together with a world-class art museum that continues to reshape the cultural landscape and continues to influence contemporary art and design throughout the world. So, you know, please help celebrate the School of the Art Institute and thank you all for coming today and uh, enjoy the panel discussion. Well, thank you, Daniel, and, and uh, thank you all for coming. And ha any SIC alums here? All right. well, yeah, we, we know you are, yeah, but uh, okay, well, welcome um, to uh, our topic. And uh, I appreciate talking about the, the history. And I remember 1866. It was a cold winter when we when we founded the school, and the slide projector didn't well didn't have it. Uh, and uh, as you can guess, it is 2015. But we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the school in the academic year that has began a few weeks ago, and will run through next um, uh, spring. So the 150, you know, it's only the 149th anniversary right now. Uh, it is part of our uh, 150th anniversary. And we're thrilled to welcome back six uh, MFA alums from the uh, School of the Art Institute uh, who have gone on to distinguished careers. All of them are in the exhibition now called Civilization and its Discontents uh, at the Sullivan Galleries, uh, which is at 33 South State Street on the seventh floor. And of course, uh, the easy on the website to find the exact hours of it, but uh, we hope that many of you will make your way over to the to the Sullivan Galleries to see the um, uh, uh, exhibition where these six and uh, some 25 others are represented. Uh, we enjoy talking about our alums. A uh, um, uh, statement I've made many times is that you're a student at the school for four years or two years, but you're an alum for the rest of your life. Uh, and almost unknowingly, you're an alum for the rest of your life. You find that this thing that you did for a, a time in your life ends up marking you and, and how you're introduced often and how uh, some people make certain assumptions about you based on where you went to school in one place or another. So it's an interesting factoid where you went to school and I'm, we're, I'm always careful to say that we should take great pride in our alumni but not credit for our, our alumni as, a, as an institution that we play a role in their careers, sometimes a very significant role, but uh, their accomplishments are, are certainly theirs and uh, I think you'll hear from some, some very, very accomplished people today. Um, th these six are very, very used to talking about their work and providing a sort of biography of their work, you know, often starting with their early work and going up to their more recent work. We're not going to do that today. They're really here to talk a little bit about the school and its impact on their careers and on their vision as artists. Uh, and so uh, uh, we'll, we'll turn to them in, in a second. I'll give them brief introductions. Is there something you want to add? No, maybe. It's on. Hello, hello. Yeah. It is on. Um, I'm Lisa Wainwright, the Dean of Faculty at the school. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we're going to roll the images. So you can, we're going to have a, a good selection of work by these six artists. Um, and there might be some moment when we stop and chat about 
an object or an image. But uh, no, go ahead, Jim. Uh, well, I should have said that I'm Jim Yud, and uh, I teach um, uh, in the Department of Art History, and I'm the chair of the uh, New Arts Journalism MA program uh, there. Uh, why don't I do them from my left, immediate left, and we'll go to the right, and just a quick introduction so uh, you can put a name to a face. This on, uh, to the left of Lisa is Jean Dunning. Jean Dunning is a uh, received her MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, her BA from Oberlin College. Uh, she's a professor at Northwestern University in the Department of Art Theory and Practice, um, uh, has exhibited widely throughout her uh, extensive career at the SAIC in Milwaukee and San Francisco and Buffalo and New York. She was in uh, Lisa's show, Ah, Decadence, was that did that open the Sullivan Galleries? Yeah. Or was yeah, it was, it was one of the uh, the opening exhibition at the Sullivan Galleries some six or seven years ago, something like that. Um, so uh, a, a well-known artist. To her left is Caitlin Cherry, who is a BFA from the School of the Art Institute. Two of our guests today are BFAs from the school. The other four are MFAs from the school, and so they they might approach their experiences somewhat differently. It's a, it is a different experience. Uh, Caitlin Cherry re received her BFA from the School of the Art Institute in 2010 and went on for her MFA at Columbia University in New York. That's a good school too. <laughs> uh, and recently has shown, <laughs> recently has shown her work in places such as Cleveland, the Brooklyn Museum, New York, Chicago. She's been written about in magazines such as Art Forum, the New York Times, Interview, uh, Brooklyn Rail, um, uh, etc. Uh, to her left is Corey Newkirk. Corey Newkirk is a uh, what is a visiting professor? Is, is the title a visiting professor this year? Oh yeah, you've been promoted. Uh, visiting professor this year at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where he's working on on many different projects. He's also the organizer slash curator slash what was the word you like selector of the work that is in the SAIC booth uh, down at the end of this corridor and immediately to the right uh, is a group of work by SAIC recent grads and current students, and uh, Corey organized that by doing uh, uh, far too many studio visits. Um, he received his BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and went on for his master's degree at the University of California in Irvine, and he too has shown all across the country at the Wexner in Columbus, New York, Los Angeles, at the MCA here, the Whitney Biennial, uh, and many, many, many other places, and he too has a distinguished uh, record of uh, critical receptions of his work. Uh, to his left is Aspen Mays, who took a class with me and yet managed to have a significant <laughs> career despite <laughs> that impediment. So I don't even need to look this up, I will find it. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Arts at uh, the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and then came to us for her MFA in photography, which she received in 2009. And she too has exhibited her work broadly in Syracuse, New York, in New York. Uh, she was in the Crystal Bridges State of the Art exhibition that opened that institution about a year or two ago. Um, and is currently a professor at the Columbia, uh, California College of the Arts in Oakland. And next to her is Carrie Schneider. My papers are moving apace. Uh, she received her BA at Carne Carnegie Mellon, not Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, as did Andy Worrell, um, and then came to us for her MFA in photo um, at the School of the Art Institute in 2007. She immediately leaving us went on to have a, a, a Fulbright Fellowship to Helsinki, and I well remember the, the work that came out of that, um, and has continued to exhibit work widely in Milwaukee, Los Angeles, in Helsinki, San Francisco, Pittsburgh, and many, many other places, and is currently, what would you describe it? You're doing what at Bard? Okay, a master seminar in professional practice at Bard College. Um, and at the uh, furthest down the line from me is Chris Ware, a well-known Chicago figure and artist, and currently the William and Stephanie Sick profe distinguished, well, the distinguished, distinguished. Yeah, not just professor, distinguished professor. <laughs> it's not like, it's not just suede, it's ultra suede. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's the same thing, not just professor, but distinguished professor. Um, and uh, Chris Ware, of course, is well known to us here as one of the uh, foremost uh, cartoon-based uh, artists of the 20th and 21st century. Uh, he had come to us, he had uh, worked first at the University of Texas in Austin, and then came to the SAC for his MFA. 
And he too has uh, exhibited widely in the Art Institute at, in New York and Paris. Uh, he contributes, of course, his graphic art to the New Yorker and the New York Times. He was also a participant in the Whitney Biennial and uh, um, is, uh, uh, we're very, very happy to welcome him back this year as the sick professor, uh, um, distinguished professor. So uh, without further ado, I think you're going to open the... Yeah, let's talk. So thank you, Jim. Um, my first question to the panel uh, addresses the experience of attending the school, if you could reflect on that experience and how it might have shaped your career in any way. I'm going to give you three versions of SAIC mission that might be helpful as you think of this. One is we are a museum school. That's the distinguishing characteristic of our particular institution. There's only one other left in the country, that's Boston. Very small museum and a smaller school. We have an encyclopedic museum. So I'm interested to know if that had an impact on you and if it still does, the museum school. Secondly, part of our mission is that meaning and making are inseparable. Meaning and making are inseparable. That's one of our calling cards that we teach traditional techniques, crafts, metier, but we're also very committed to theory and history and the realm of ideas. And we try not to segregate those things, but keep them in constant dialogue. Was that your experience? Was that not your experience? I'd like to hear about that. I just heard Rob Store, another alum, talk about talk about, was I not on the whole time? Could you hear anything I just said? Oh, okay, good. That's good. I don't want to repeat that. Um, Rob Store just said something about, oh, art is just, it's become information art. It's just information art. There's no erotics left in art anymore, said Rob Store. So that's, so we like information and erotics. That's our thing. So how did that work for you? And then lastly, uh, the interdisciplinarity. Did you move across media? This is, we have an open curriculum at SAIC as an undergraduate, so Caitlin and Corey, you're not allowed to major. Did that work for you? Did that not work for you? And on the graduate level as well, graduate students can come into the school and study with any faculty member across the institution. So those are the three things for me, but you could riff off of anything. Museum school, interdisciplinarity, erotics versus information. And just a procedural thing, as so we won't also sort of be looking at each other, why don't we start in this one with Jean and go across the, the group in turn? Just start the world. Okay. <laughs> because I'll tell you why. Wait, wait. I'll tell you why I say that. Um, the, the missions of the school that you just articulated, I, I'm, I'm the oldest, the, the, the uh, when I graduated, yes, the most senior alum, when I graduated was the longest to go of anyone in the group. And I was just saying when we all met each other beforehand that uh, listening to people just chat about their experience of the school and all, that so much of what I experienced is not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think the way you articulated the missions really speaks towards that. So I think you should start with somebody who's more recent mm -hmm. for this question. Well, I can. I can. Well, uh, <laughs> I <pass the> <laughs> um, well yeah. I, I I just received my BFA. I think just it was five years ago, but uh, in 2010. So I think um, you know. I I might. <laughs> the school has changed a lot, but um, I feel like you know maybe I, I do have a strong connection with maybe current students. Um, I just remember um, I came here in 2006 and um, I wasn't quite sure. I knew I wanted to be in the arts, but I wasn't quite sure in what capacity. So I, I started off um, pretty much uh, thinking that I was going to enter into the fashion program. And um, at some point, I was really into the designing and then at some point uh, I think it was like the day that we were going to start construction. I just 
was like, no, <laughs> this is not, this is not how it's going to be. Um, so I continued into, uh, you know, pretty much like formulating my own uh, curriculum. I took a lot of classes that were, I took like intro to fibers. I took intro to um, pretty much intro to everything. And um, I think that ended up inevitably like shaping my identity as like an artist that does work that's very interdisciplinary as a result. And, um, you know, even though my, my core was kind of like painting and drawing at the time, it was um, inevitably influenced um, those intro classes, even though I didn't get too far into it, kind of uh, shaped my perception of like what it is or like what it means to like be a maker, period. Um, where it's like, I, I think that's unique to like the SAIC experience because, you know, you do just graduate with your, your BFA in, I, I think they call it BFA in studio. Um, it's just, you know, it's like a clean, it's like, you know, build your own <laughs> BYO <laughs> degree. And <laughs> that's cool, you know, that's like, I think that's important, especially, you know, when you're receiving your bachelor's to not be, if I had been steered into painting for four years, I probably, you know, would have been burnt out by it or, you know, I'd been feeling like I'm going down this inevitable path. Um, but I arrived at my own idea of like being an artist and, um, yeah, I'm, you know, I guess that's, uh, that only answers maybe one of the three, but. <laughs> but Corey, did you also were an undergrad, so the open curriculum was that important as well? When it passed? I don't, I don't have. Uh, <laughs> um, well, it's actually surprising because when you said that you're not allowed to have a major, that was news to me. I had never heard that before. Um, but I, I, I will say that I enjoyed not having to stick with one sort of department or uh, focus. I, the reason I came to the school was one department and I took one class and realized that that was not going to work and immediately sort of went to somewhere that felt right. Um, that's, that's kind of. Yeah, I should clarify. It's not, did I say not allowed? Yeah, you like said you not said allowed. Like, oh, which I'm was sorry. Kind of nice sorry, Walter. Though. That was interesting. Uh, like that it's a rule that well, you cannot. Well, it's not a rule. There's no, you, you, you can't declare a major. There's no box you pick. However, if a student wishes to concentrate right. in painting, of course, we're down with that. But they take ceramics classes in order to enhance their painting or they take a film class in order to enhance their painting. So well, there are people who stay it within it's a, a medium. It can be a very well-rounded education. Right. 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 Museum school, anybody want to comment on that? Was that important to you? I could say something. Yes, Chris. <laughs> I guess, yes. Um, I, uh, I, I'm not really, I, I found, I, as a kid, I went to a, 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 a art classes at the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha, Nebraska, where I was from, and I would go past the artwork and I would just think, I don't even understand what all this is for, and I, uh, some like third rate Renaissance paintings or something, it would just seem like it wasn't a part of the world that I lived in. But when I came to the art, in, in other words, like I really wasn't moved by the artwork that much, like I didn't, it didn't get through my dense skull like what it was basically but when I came to the Art Institute it's the only time I've ever been moved it's embarrassing to say to tears by a painting which is the Philip Guston painting of him in bed holding the paintbrushes clutching his wife which to me is like one of the great paintings of the 20th century and that moment just being in the Art Institute like coming from my studio in the Pakula building and feeling really like shit and just hating not what I was doing and feeling bad and I was cold outside and gray and I'm just thinking why am I living here I'm a failure and then to get to the <laughs> art institute and I saw that painting and it was sort of a, a a good focusing moment not that it necessarily made me feel any better at all but it was uh, you know this is like <laughs> this is the role of art I think so great <laughs> I have. It's um, my mom in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the the museum. I, there was something I had wanted to say anyway about the the museum being a part of the school, and it wasn't just I, you know I would cut through the museum in order to get to the Columbus Building, 
um, in the winter when it was so ungodly cold. But you know, there was also another benefit to doing that is kind of getting to see, obviously, all the the art that was there. I it, it's the it's kind of my museum. I, I grew up in Chicago, and so it was kind of the first place that I went to see art. And I actually had a a really amazing experience as a teenager, standing in front of a Georgia O'Keeffe painting and realizing, you know, remembering that that was what you know I knew and that I wanted to be an artist there. But it, I think it did. You know, I I was a grad student, um, graduated in 2007, and one of my advisors was Greg Bordowitz. I was in the the photo department, as was um, Aspen, and um, I, you know, I, so I got to study with uh, Claire Pentecost and Barbara De Genevieve, but part of the, you know the multi multi Multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. It's all all good. It's all you know, just whatever uh, interdisciplinarity, whatever. Um, I got to study with amazing individuals like um, Greg Bordowitz or Joseph Grigley or Michelle Grabner. You know, it's just I got to study with people all all over the place. And I remember in one of my advising sessions with Greg Bordowitz, he suggested we walk through the museum together. And I remember, it, this was a really vivid memory, we were in standing in front of this painting and he said, you know, I think you're afraid of allegory. And I was just like, what are you talking about? I am not. And it kind of made me, it forced me to kind of think about the kind of work I was making. I was making this photographic work that was um, very performative and kind of these stage tableau type scenarios. And it kind of pushed me to make this this one uh, photograph. It was kind of my thesis piece that the museum ended up collecting, having a, as a part of their permanent collection in the end. So it was kind of this, this moment, and I think this was the larger thing I wanted to talk about, my experience in being at the Art Institute, um, was that there was this like really antagonistic sort of spirit that actually was a non-negative for me, that having this moment of being like, you're afraid of allegory. Or these, I remember having an interview to get into the school with um, Ken Fandel and our, our dear, late, great Barbara De Genevieve. And just have it coming out of there, my blood boiling, <laughs> and kind of just being like, "What just happened? I want more of that, you know." And so I think like there was something. Maybe the school attracts um, students who kind of thrive on that sort of antagonism or struggle, or there, there was something about that that you know. When I was thinking about being on this panel, that just kept coming up for me again and again. Thinking about individuality and struggle, thinking about civilization and its uh, discontents that being about the struggle of the individual. So anyway, I have more to say about that, but uh, I just wanted to put that out there. Okay. Aspen, did you want <laughs> My mother. <laughs> uh, it's actually really great to hear that. I was wondering if that was a similar experience for people walking through the Art Institute between classes. It was a treasured time for me as well in the winter, and I would always try to plan a different route. You know, today I'm going to go downstairs and try and come up this floor and it became a real education that paralleled what was going on. Uh, absolutely, and as Carrie mentioned, I was part of the photo department, and I was trying to think of a way to describe that environment when we were there with, with Barbara and Claire and Ken, and felt like really productive disagreement, kind of about everything, and in not in an antagonism that was um, respect, respectful and, and healthy and exciting to be a part of. And I would also mention about the interdisciplinarity. It was something that I thought about when I was looking for a graduate school, and it felt here like it was a thing that was alive. And, and, and I've been a part of other institutions where it's almost that thing on the checklist, like we really got to strive for in a, you know, this is something that we really need to figure out. And here it was nothing to figure out, it was just this thing that was, was living and breathing all the time. And, uh, and that was really exciting for me to be a part of. So Jean, maybe you could take the last part because you were uh, at the school, I would say, in part of a very, uh, one of the leaders of what one would talk about as a conceptual scene uh, in Chicago. So information and erotics, do you want to tackle that one? Oh, I thought you were talking about making and meaning. Yeah, making and meaning, go ahead. Oh, information and erotics, that's a lot more complicated than making and meaning. Okay, take making and meaning. (laughs) Well, um, what I was, uh, you know, coming to this panel makes me think more directly about something that I think is present for me all the time because I still live in Chicago and you can't be involved in art in Chicago without um, the Art Institute, the School of the Art Institute, being very present for you all the time because there are students from this place and graduates from this place everywhere, but also if you're an artist here, half the people you know who are also artists teach there, right? And so it's very present for me all the time. And so I have been aware of how much it's changed, but I think 
coming to this panel makes me think about that even more. And listening to you articulate the, the goals of the school, sort of the way they approach going about educating people, it, it's really interesting to hear you say it out loud because I don't think that was the attitude when I was a student. And um, I think it's been kind of great seeing the school move from a time where, you know, I, I would never for a second um, criticize the presence of the imagist and the influence they have at SAIC. Really important, fantastic work. But when I was a student, it felt overbearing. It felt like there was not very much room for the meaning part and so much emphasis on the making part. And I feel watching the school from somewhat on the outside now for a long time that you've got a really great balance of that going on right now. And that's wonderful to see. Yeah. Great. Good. Mom, all our, our mothers moms came to support us. Our mother. <laughs> Cord, do you want to say something? I, I, I w I'd like to sort of second that because I think when I was there, there was probably um, a little less emphasis on the meaning, too, and, and sort of that was a really difficult thing to find sometimes around, uh, around that, the Columbus building at that time. And so I know that when I left, I really sort of went to look for something that I could not find in Chicago. But, you know, there's not, there wasn't a lot that I couldn't find at the school, but there were some certain key things that I really felt that I was not able to get. But I see that those um, those spaces have been filled. So since now that I've returned, that, that, that those questions have kind of been answered and those, those perhaps those issues uh, have been addressed, which is really nice to see. So um, that the current students don't have to deal with some of the things that perhaps I had to sort of fight to do and see and hear and talk about, but I'm, no, I, I cannot uh, really elaborate on that. I, it looked like you were going to ask no, me No, no, I um, just wanted to, to uh, <laughs> have a shout out to the former Dean Carol Becker, because Carol, I think, was instrumental in raising the bar around theory uh, at SAIC during her tenure as, as Dean, and I think she um, really made a mark well, on I feel changing luckily uh, I missed uh, that where part. the school <laughs> went in terms of her hires. Um, so shout out to Carol Becker, right. who's now the dean at Columbia University. Yeah, yeah I mean the, the I've been here the longest of anyone uh, on the on the dais here, um, and can remember the the time when it, the SASC was a superb and well known and nationally recognized regional art school, that it really was the school of the Midwest, and so George O'Keefe from Wisconsin went here, and Grant Wood from Iowa went here, and Thomas R. Benton from Missouri went here, and then of course all of the Chicago and, and Veron's people went here. And then I remember the 125th anniversary. I w I, um, we curated a show for it at, in the Art Institute, and the title of that was America Studio. We went through this whole America Studio thing for in the late 80s into the 90s, when we were a national school, where we really started to get, as we have here, people from around the country were coming to grad school or, or undergrad school here. And it changed the school a little bit, and some of the issues that, that had been present in the 60s and 70s sort of disappeared. And now, I don't even know if we have a sort of umbrella term for us any longer. Not, we don't, we're not claiming America Studio any longer. Um, but now it's global an international studio, school. Yeah. It's really a global yeah. school. Uh, in, in many ways, and that may just simply be mirroring, you know, the developments that are outside of it, but it's also really, really changed the culture of the school a great deal uh, from when I first um, arrived here. And, you know, let's, we should plug the erotics of art, too, because I think that, that, that we have seen the return of craft, that's a word that we didn't use for very long, and now we're theorizing around craft, but make, making and meaning are inseparable, and the meaning got foregrounded for a while, and then the making came back, and this is why there's a renaissance of the imagists right now. I, I think you go out into this fair, and you know, Matthew Mark's gallery's got a Sue Ellen Roca on the wall. You, phenomenal. I mean, so this is, 
it's, it's all in play. I don't think we have to ask the, you know, the uh, adversarial, the critical questions that we ask of you all in the studio. Why this representation? Who's got the power? That's kind of been absorbed. It's still critical and adversarial, but on another level. I don't know. It's 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 a it's a wonderful moment. Um, yeah. Well, let me turn to the yeah. to, to, yeah. to a second question for our, our panelists. Um, and I'm curious now, we sort of asked about your experience while you were here, and, and I'm kind of interested in what your experience is now that you're, you're out in your lives and careers, and you are asked, you know, by another artist or by a curator somewhere, where did you go to school, and you say the School of the Art at the City of Chicago. We're always curious as to what, does, what do you think that means? What do you think the phrase, I went to the School of the Art at the City of Chicago, means and says about you to other arts professionals? Uh, not necessarily as compared to somebody who says, well, I went to KCAI or I went to CalArts or something like that, but what, what does, what's the brand as you've experienced it out in the world as a professional? Uh, we know how highly ranked it is in national surveys, and so does it just simply get that sort of knee-jerk respect, or is it, uh, do people ask you about teachers or your classmates or things along the line? Uh, wh what does it mean, and, and really how, how some of you have gone into academics yourself, to what degree did it prepare you uh, to become teachers of, of art, um, and um, uh, you know, things like that. Jean, you can go first on this one, since you have become a professor in our local community. Uh, do you find, when you were a young teacher, do, did you find yourself using things you had seen here, or? I guess it's so long ago, I can't remember. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't remember uh, feeling that way, although I undoubtedly did, because I think you always use everything that ever happened mm -hmm. to you. And, you know, um, between Oberlin and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, those were my two experiences of higher education, and that's what you use, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think actually the way I taught when I first started teaching had a lot of a lot to do with a reaction against some of what I thought was missing was that when I was at school here so I really pushed the meaning part because I felt like an awful lot of the time people taught art in a way where they they encourage young artists to um, not take responsibility for what they did and and to not understand what they did I, I often felt like people were encouraging artists to say, yeah, you don't have to understand your own work, you don't have to know what it means, encouraging this idea that if you did learn to understand your own work, you would somehow kill it, because it had to all come from some place that was not conscious, right? And so I really reacted against that. But you know, in terms of influence, I suppose, in a way, that's like one of the most profound kinds of influence when you do the opposite, right? Speaking of our mothers, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, I guess it's good that you made me go first because as I keep talking, I'm realizing it probably did Im influence the way I talk quite a bit, and I too have found myself then going back the other way now, because in in a certain way, I think you alluded to this already, um, a kind of criticality has almost taken over the art world, and there's so much language about things that it gets away from the stuff that's hard to talk about, which I think you're bringing up when you talk about the erotics. So I feel like now I actually pull back a little bit from everything always being about what you can understand and what you can talk about, because that leaves out too much. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else like to take a whack at it? Yeah. Or as, and for some of you, could you, if uh, Barbara Je Genevieve's name has come up a few times, was there someone else that when you think of your who you, who you stayed in touch with, it could even be a colleague as opposed to a faculty member. Is did you have a mentor here or a colleague that uh, really ha affected your career here and uh, after he your time here? Do you want to try that? Sure. I can. I. Uh, I was going to say a, l a little bit about the kind of what do people think about? Right. You know when I say that I went to the art institute, I think it, for me it, it seems like there's a little bit of a like a 
understanding, but a blank stare, you know, because I think there's something, it's understood as a more of a force or something rather than it's not like a school, like in an orthodox sense of a school, like, oh, then I think I get an idea of what your work is going to look like. You know, it, when someone says they've gone to some other sort of institution that maybe prides themselves on shaping the students in a certain way, this is like, you know, it, like Molly Zuckerman Hartung went to the same school as Zach Prekop. You know, like you couldn't have two different looking, you know, uh, outputs coming out of the exact same program. And so I think that that, there's an understanding, but kind of like an abstraction to that as well that I think is, is really compelling. Um, you know, but I, to answer the, the other question, I, you know, now that I, I teach, I think that the, the way that I was taught here has really shaped the way that I approach my teaching and my students and thinking of it as being non-hierarchical, you know, kind of thinking about, um, again, about struggle or an, antagonism, again, just that that's coming up for me, that I, you know, I guess I, I worked really closely with Joseph Grigley, and I learned through him about um, the the romantic poet John Keats, uh, the um, the concept of a negative possibility or um, negative potential, and that that that's um, that that's kind of something that can drive an individual to work through something that's uncertain. And I think that 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 is kind of um, really compelling to me. It continues to kind of. Um, push me in, in thinking and relating to my students and that we're, you know, I'm an artist too. I'm, I'm in this struggle with you and then to kind of look, look for problems as a way of finding inspiration and I think that that's the way that I work as an artist. I kind of try to find something in the world that I'm curious about or that I see as being problematic or see um, um, that there's something socially that I'm, I'm confused by or I think needs to be kind of um, responded to. And I use that as a stepping off point for, for making my work. So uh, yeah, again, kind of thinking about struggle. Um, I, I will say that I run into people who went through, I, I don't know if I could say graduated, but passed through this institution since I, it's been quite a long time since I've been there, and constantly people ask me if I know someone, right? I, no matter where I am in the world, so, and, uh, and it comes up, someone seems to know someone who went here, which I guess is a great thing because it means that the school is a beast, right? That's how I think about it. Like, it's not, not quite a factory, but some sort of other kind of creature that produces all of these artists all over, and I can never sort of you know, there's always a name, but there's never a face. But I think a part of that is when I was there, it was still smaller. It's a little easier, but I still can't remember anybody. But I like that wherever I go, there's someone, there seems to be someone who we have something in common, and that can be um, this place. Uh, I will also say that in my teaching, I am surprised to s hear myself say things that were said to me, <coughs> <laughs> almost verbatim. Um, I, that's a really strange situation to Can find myself in. Can you give an example? Um, do you want the, t the faculty name yeah. or just the example? <laughs> yeah. um, it's, and it's really surprising. I find myself quoting uh, Michiko often. Michiko is a tani. Yes. Uh, about sort little tiny things that were just said in a random crit that that perhaps have stuck in my head and and I find myself in a in a situation where it just seems so appropriate and I go oh I haven't heard or thought about that in so many years but it's perfect for this moment so there's a lot of her in there there's a little bit of Ray Yoshida but that's more in my um, attitude mm -hmm. I think. Uh -oh. Right, um, more my attitude, and there, there's uh, a little bit of, uh, I think, Jim Zanzi in there, right? So there's Mary Lou's, I, you know, I could go on. There's, it's so many, it's the, it's, there's almost too many to choose from mm -hmm. to, to sort of say who has uh, influenced and touched sort of my artistic career and educational career, and now my own sort of, I guess I teach. Sort of thing. Chris, did you want to say something? I was, I was just going to say, it makes me think of parenting, basically. You know, like you're saying, like, oh, Jesus, I'm saying what my dad told me, you know. Uh -huh. my, my daughter's 10 years old, and she 
likes to draw, and she'd done a drawing, I don't know, a few weeks ago or so, and I was looking at it, and I literally said to her, down in the, I said, oh, down in this corner, there's some kind of nus- nice stuff going on. I'm like, <laughs> where did that come from? You know, I know, like, I heard that at a critique or something. That's, like, just the standard applique when you can't think of anything to say. So I was like, I don't know. That's not enlightening at all, but whatever. <laughs> Aspen, do you have a... Yeah, sure, I'll jump in on this too, because um, I also teach, so it really I find myself reflecting often on how profoundly this experience, you know, the teachers that I had. I ran into Robert Clark Davis uh, yesterday, and, he, and I said, oh, how's, the depart- how's everything, how's the photo department? He said, oh, don't worry, we're still only nominally interested in photography. Mm. <laughs> like, oh, that sounds, that's good, that sounds about right. <laughs> and if you know Clark, you know the spirit of that statement, but it also, you know, it's... It is a way that I think about how to teach that medium or what it might mean or, or those sorts of things. I also um, would give props to, to Oxbow. I spent a summer there as a grad student and then have now taught there several times. And that has been really shaping and almost as a, as a place that I've tried out a lot of teaching ideas. It's felt like a space that's mm-hmm. playful and, and I feel like I've really been able to try things out in that environment that have then made it into kind of every classroom environment. So that's been an important thing for me as well. Mm -hmm. And Caitlin, uh, uh, sometimes an undergraduate has such a different kind of experience as Corey had uh, than a graduate student, but was there something in your time here that you particularly remember? Um, Well, I feel like, uh, especially after I I moved to New York, after I graduated from here uh, with my bachelor's, and um, I feel like kind of going back to the conversation about sort of like the meaning and the making, I, I felt like, um, you know, SAIC has a really strong conceptual sort of presence, at least like that's the way that I move through the program. Um, and when I got to uh, grad school, you can kind of see like you start meeting other artists who are coming from different uh, BFA programs and you can kind of see like where the differing like school philosophies start to come and influence the way that they are entering their, their masters and like how they uh, approach, you know, studio practice. And, um, you know, I feel like uh, with SAIC being, my idea of it being like, uh, you, you come out of there with like a very strong conceptual um, understanding of like, it's, it's really, I felt like I, I came out of there about the idea and so um, I felt like I was like moving through my master's program as like like maybe like a little Tasmanian devil <laughs> like mm-hmm. trying to like throw stuff together and like uh, people were like I you know they'd like come into my studio and then just kind of like slowly back out <laughs> like she's um, <laughs> it's like she's doing that she's doing that thing again um, but you know I, I kind of attribute that to like you know SAC has like a strong conceptual presence and I think that, you know, uh, kind of maybe I was at SAIC when Carol was leaving, and now Carol was at uh, Columbia. So, you know, she's <laughs> like she's like a Tasmanian devil in herself, where, like, I followed her through that. But um, in addition to that, like, um, I, I'm noticing uh, now I'm in New York, and, like, I see a lot of, see, like, at least, like, a lot of... Um, contemporary art which are being heavily influenced by ideas that have like originated kind of like from like the images time and like uh, it's kind of returning now in like a full force and you see a lot of um, you know in addition to like you actually do run into a lot of people like I I feel like SDIC is a little bit of like a uh, maybe outside of the city of Chicago is a bit of like a sleeping giant where it mm-hmm. like has influence like it's, it's like a uh, like roots that like kind of are like um its impact is like very wide spreading um and you right now i'm really seeing that in like uh contemporary art um and i think people don't always people are not always able to like bring it back to fdic but it's very distinctly like okay and you're gonna uh, something that you know is what uh SAIC has like developed, so you know it's like I, I feel like it's 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 very strong, it's 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 beastly, <laughs> it's beastly. Well, like I mean, 
the Chicago Images or whatever you want to call them, all those artists. I mean, they're the reason I came here. I specifically came to take classes with Jim Nutt. I mean, and they were making artwork about stuff when it was really not the thing to do to make art about anything. You know, if you if you had to uh, talk about it or say that it was about something, then it was immediately cast into the realm of illustration, which was the worst thing you could all you'd possibly do. You know, so I I think that it's. When you, I, I haven't I've been kind of out of the loop for a while. I had no idea that the that there was a, a disregard of the images or anything. It just seemed to me like they were always important as far as I was concerned. So um, I think it's it, that's one of the things I actually like about Chicago is because it's a it's a, a place in a city where you can say what you mean and and you really can't pull the wool over anybody's eyes here. And I think that's reflected in the artwork here. So I, I wouldn't say that the disregard. I think that it was for a time perceived as the most important form of expression in the Chicago landscape, which was certainly not the case. It was more certain critics, sorry Jim, who were writing about the imagist and championing the imagist, Dennis Adrian and others, and I think that that there were other things going on that we just weren't looking at. So it wasn't a disregard, it was more they're not the only game in town. Important game, no question, but not the only game in town. I would put it that way. Um, let's talk about the show for a second. I don't know. Ha have any of you seen the Sullivan show? Raise your hand if you've seen Civilization and its discontents. Okay, good. So uh, uh, quite a number of you who have seen the show. It's kind of a wonderful antidote to the fair just in terms of the installation, right? It's uh, very sparse in, in respect to the installation. You've got like jeans, there's a wall with one um, uh, Jean Dunning photograph on a large wall, uh, same with Carrie, same with all of you. E each of you has a wall and, and it really, we were talking about this earlier, it allows one to really t study the piece, to really stay with the piece, to experience this piece. So my question for you all is, what do you think about the show? What do you think about that installation? I'm sure this is the first time, well, maybe not, but it's rare to have a show installed in the way that that show is installed. Scott Reader and Tyson Reader have a particular aesthetic. If you know their work and their curatorial work in particular, do you feel that um, that was played out? Are, were you surprised that you were in a in a Scott and Tyson Reader Brothers show? Why were you in a Scott and Tyson Reader Brothers show? You know, had we had somebody else curate the last 25 years, it'd probably be a slightly different uh, selection of artists because we have so many great uh, alumni from the last 25 years. So let's talk about that show. Who did the Reader Brothers leave out in respect to the Reader Brother? vision, version, if you will. I'm honored to be in the show. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's good, that's good. Uh, yeah, absolutely, I'll, I will second that. I was really um, honored that they, when they reached out and, and somewhat surprised, like, oh, you know, this is, Right, looking at that list of alumni, you could have, it's a staggering list. Um, so I was really yeah, touched to be invited and, and, the, and the show does look great. And it's really, um, uh, it has a, the installation, there's a lot of breathing room, which you don't often see. So that, and that space is so huge. Um, I was, I've been trying to, they sent, you know, full disclosure, they sent us that prompt. So I've been stewing on whether or not something was left out um, when I was looking at the show and, and it, I guess, you know, and I was having some conversations with some other alums about a representation of the kind of messiness, and I don't mean formal messiness, I just mean the kind of, um, the stew here the, that we were all a part of and, and how to represent that. And I was trying to think of an example and I was remembering an, an artist couple that I was at school with and they went by Kate and Paul at that time, but now they go by something else. I was like, I don't even know where they are because they changed their names several times in graduate school. They lived in their studio. Um, they went by Beauregard and Lily for a little while, if anyone remembers that phase. So it was like, how does that part, that felt really a big part of the experience, how does that get represented? And is that represented in the show? I don't know. That's a thought. 
help. I feel like I'm saying too much, but it made me reminded me that people that I knew when I was in art school, like fellow painting students and sculptors that were friends of mine, were really in a way like the most important people and figures to my mind and shape what I was thinking about art more than even professors, if I can say that without offending anyone, or the artists that the professors were advising we look at. Um, and I and I think of those people very fondly in my memory, and the, and I kind of got that feeling at the show as well. It kind of gave me that MFA feeling all over again. So, the, but you know, I I would say that <coughs> I thought it could have been a little weirder. Weird. A little. I mean, you know, that I love both of them. I th I like their sort of how they are, but uh, um, I thought. The, the nature of this school is kind of weird, right? The, it's weird. It's a weird place. It's a very strange place. And I thought that it was interesting to see how some, perhaps some more of the roughness uh, of the school and what happens there can get um, taken, well, sanded down, smoothed out a little. But I think that is also a reflection of sort of a distance from the school, it being sort of an alumni show. So. Um, that I thought was, um, and uh, that that is also not a plug for everyone to go see the the booth, right? Which is also weird because the place is weird. Um, but I thought that for an alumni show, I particularly of this place that is about that institution, could have been, you know, a you know a little weirder. It's the white cube phenomenon, also. Oh, that's not right. That's. Your parents. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> you. I think but the white right? cube does it that a, a little bit stranger. too, Corey. You know, I mean that is it the it sanitizes the work. Yeah, and so and that's and that's kind of interesting to to think about because um, I will badmouth um, stuff all the time. You know, other artists, not by name, but just in generally, like you know, I think all artists, you know, we're all we all stink. You know, we're strange. We're weird. They're you know, difficult, and to sort of see that, have that sanitation happen again, I, I think we see it all the time, but I think in particular when it's talking about something that I think we all know so intimately in different ways, it, it's a little, um, it's a little odd, but enjoyable, and, and, and I think that it's interesting to think about how those things happen and why those things happen. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, going back to like, uh, well, for one, the Sullivan Galleries is really like, I mean, I think you could probably like have a football game in there. So like any art <laughs> that tries to exist in that space cannot, you know, really have its like, you know, it, it's hard to be intimate with art in that space. So like, I think things were really quieted down. But um, I remember seeing the I think I saw the artist list not that long uh, ago, and I was just kind of like floored by, you know, that's like a little bit going back to what I was saying about how you just don't realize how big of an impact the school has. Where I was like, I didn't know, you know, like I went to Columbia University and like uh, Sanford Biggers and like Rick Crit are like prominent full-time faculty, well, you know, faculty there. I'm like, I didn't know, <laughs> like, I didn't know, like, Jeff Koons and, like, you know, you really just, you know, even though, you know, I've been here, you know, as a student, like, I didn't really quite understand, like, how big of an impact, like, the school has on really, like, some of the most prominent contemporary artists working today, and um, it's going back to... Uh, I had Tyson uh, as a, I think I had him as a, a critic in advanced painting for maybe one semester. Um, it's probably like in 2009 or 2010. And um, I was just thinking about, he had said something, he said something to me in the studio um, in advanced painting that I like never forgot. <laughs> and uh, it was something like a combination of like his energy, uh, which kind of like I'd maybe had a little bit of an impact on like, uh, how I treat like being an artist because I think that um, talking about that weirdness there is something about like maybe it's like the combination of faculty that tends to like be around uh, but it, it, th there's kind of like a bit of like okay yeah don't take yeah like we're we've made this decision to be an artist but also like just do what you want to do like <laughs> and like 
you can claim it as art no, like no matter what it is and uh, I think they have that energy and it, it kind of produces it produces like serious prominent artists that you think are like told you know serious like uh, but they're they're also like you know they just you you make it and you just just have to have that confidence in it and that's kind of like what they represent the brothers represent to me and like my my experience um on the one hand much to my surprise i thought the work was really really good <laughs> <laughs> and i say that because i don't i you know i don't think there are too many people here who know me very well but anybody who knows me very well knows that I have very, very high expectations of art, and I actually tend to take most things in the world too seriously, and art is one of them. I, I don't know if it's on. I think um, uh, I, I have very high expectations of art, and I, I um, don't really think most work that I see is that strong. I want a lot out of works of art. So I don't go into too many shows that I think are really fantastic. And I, I often see lots of work that I think is interesting, has some good things about it, but is, is n not as strong as I thought a lot of the work in the show was. So I was really surprised in a, a great way at how strong the work was. And I think that does say a lot, as other people have said here. On the other hand, I said, I was talking to somebody at the opening, and I said that I thought that the work looked really good. And this person said, well, yeah, but like, look at all the people who should be in the show that aren't. It's very specific to the reader's aesthetic. And I hadn't really been thinking about that. Uh, but as soon as the person said it, I was like, well, yeah, it, it really is. I wasn't aware when I was asked to be in the show if the readers were actually making all the choices about who's invited to be in it, if they were getting advised by other people as well, which sometimes happen in a show like this. And it does really represent their aesthetic. And um, it, we've been encouraged to name names. We were encouraged to name names um, when we met before the panel started. And of course, as soon as the moderators mentioned that to us, we were all like, oh, I don't know if we want to do that, right? <laughs> Especially when Jim said, he said, well, and anytime somebody talks about a show and talks about the people who should be included, it, sound, it seems to me that they should be obligated to say who should be taken out as well. <laughs> and then we were like, oh, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> But I will just tell you a story, because I, and I don't think the names I'm going to name are, um, it's not a, a, a sort of studied idea of who should have been included in the show and wasn't. But at the opening, I ran into Inigo Manglano Avalle, who is an alum and whose work is included in the show. And he wanted to see my piece, and we had to walk around for a while to find it in the labyrinth. I couldn't find it, but eventually we did. And I mean, I found it first, but I couldn't get back. <laughs> but um, um, we are standing in front of it. And the piece that I have in the show is actually a really, really early piece. I had hoped to show a, a more recent piece that's a video. And the readers said that they had too many videos. And so I pulled this out of my basement. And so it's from 1990. It's from a long time ago. And Inigo and I are standing in front of it on its big wall, where you can really see it. And he said, wow, it's just so funny seeing this work, because I remember seeing this when it was first shown. And it really takes me back to what the art world in Chicago was like then, and all the artists that we were hanging out with and showing with. And he started naming names. And you know, of course, Judy Ledgerwood came up as somebody who's not in the show. I said, Joe Scanlon. And there are lots of names like that. And again, who knows why they are or not. It does have something to do with the aesthetic of the readers and probably all sorts of other things. But it makes me realize that you could probably do a show of this scale like every year for the next 25 years, and you'd have 25 really good shows, which is kind of amazing. With no repeats. With no repeats. Well, that's about as that's, that's a good about ending. As good as I do <laughs> uh, we have reached the end of our time. I know that uh, we were hoping to take questions from the audience. I know that the panelists will be happy to ha to chat with you as we 
uh, exit if you have a question or something you want to put to them. So uh, if I might, uh, for us, I want to, want to thank, of course, our, our panelists, Jean Dunning, Caitlin Cherry, Corey Newkirk, Aspen Mays, Carrie Schneider, and Chris Ware for their generous sharing with us of their memories of their time at the SASC. Thanks.